My name is Jonathan Lim. I'm a senior associate at Wilmer Hale, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the organizers for, for inviting me, and also congratulations for putting together what I think is a first-rate panel to discuss the issue, the issues we have before us. Um, I will introduce him briefly to you, but we have got a mix of common law, civil law practitioners, and leading scholars um, in the field to talk to you about belt and road disputes. What does that mean? Um, and we will we'll be interrogating um, what the Belt and Road Initiative is and what it entails for dispute resolution um, and dispute resolution mechanisms. Our first speaker for today is uh, Mr. Chong Yi Leong who is a, the co-head of the International Arbitration Group at Ellen and Gladhill, a leading Singapore firm and one of the leading practitioners in Asia Pacific. Um, he will be followed by Mr. Guillerme Amaral, who is one of the founding partners of Suto Korea, Cesar, Lumertz and Amaral. Um, he heads the dispute resolution practice there. Um, importantly also for our purposes, he is the ambassador um, to the Commission of the ICC International Court for, for Arbitration on the Belt and Road Initiative, and frequently deals with Chinese parties investing in Latin America. Following Mr. Amaral will be Ms. Melody Wang, who is the head of the Commercial Disputes Group at Fangda Partners, which is one of the largest and leading um, law firms in China. Um, Mel Melody represents clients in high-stakes litigation and arbitrations, often um, involving complex issues and in a cross-border context. And last but certainly not least, we have Professor Wei Xiaoku, who is an Associate Professor of Law at the University of Hong Kong. Um, she's also an Executive Council Member of the China Society of Private International Law, and her research focuses on international arbitration dispute resolution and private international law. She publishes, and this is really impressive, extensively in both English and Chinese. Um, and she has recently written a book um, on the developing world of arbitration in the Asia Pacific. And she'll be sharing some insights from that book with us today. So our topic today is um, one belt, one road, thousands of disputes. <laughs> um, you may have heard the term One Belt, One Road. It's sometimes referred to as the Belt and Road Initiative, and it's well known to be um, the signature foreign policy initiative of the government led by President Xi Jinping in China. Um, it references the old Silk Road that used to connect um, parts of China during the Han Dynasty in about 130 BC to parts of the Greco-Roman Empire to what is now modern day Iraq and Iran. Um, the image is often of a commercial, well-connected, trading, thriving China. Um, but often it's also misunderstood, even though the label is so ubiquitous. Um, just one, one snippet, if I may. The belt, and this might be surprising, refers to the land route through, through Central Asia to Europe, and the road refers to the sea route, <laughs> um, reaching to Southeast Asia and through the Indian Ocean to parts of Africa. And, and it's often also not well known that it's more of an organizing idea or concept, or have some have referred to the Belt and Road Initiative as a brand, an organizing umbrella under which many institutions and initiatives come in, but it's a broad church and many things to many people. Um, but what, what it is to us as dispute resolution practitioners and scholars certainly is a source of thousands and thousands of disputes. <laughs> and we will be exploring today um, some of the issues that come up in practice and also some of the more interesting theoretical issues that come up. So, Ilyong will start us off today by introducing the Belt and Road, the kinds of disputes that arise under that. Guillerme will then talk us through what he calls the unconventional Belt and Road. Um, 
Melody will then talk about um, China's role in some of the developments in China that have taken place um, in response to the Belt and Road Initiative, but also as just part of China's general um, inclination towards outbound investment. And Professor Gu will, will wrap us up with a, with a very broad survey of, of all the arbitration laws in the Asia Pacific. And we'll, we'll try to get through the presentations quite quickly and conclude with a roundtable discussion on several topics that we're hoping to involve the audience with as well. So we hope you will, put, will join us in that. Without further ado, um, Ilion. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, great, thanks. Now, I'm going to just give a very broad uh, thumbnail sketch of what Belt Road Initiative is before we, we dive into the deeper issues. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about very quickly. These are the topics that we'll talk about. Belt Road 101. What is one road, one belt, or one belt, one road, or BRI? Uh, it, it is actually a strategy. It's not an a agreement that's signed by parties. It's not um, a particular document that you, you sign up to. But it is actually a strategy that is launched by the Chinese government with the intention of promoting economic cooperation among countries along the proposed Belt Road uh, routes. There are 65 jurisdictions involved in the routes that have been mapped out. And the objective is really to encourage free, free flow of economic factors. I suppose given the, the varying degrees of economic development that will start off, I think, with a free flow of goods, then maybe we get into free flow of services, and later maybe we can get free flow of people. But we will, I think, get there very slowly in terms of the free flow of people. Uh, there is no one umbrella contract, as I've said. Okay, it is a, uh, like I say, a strategy, and countries get involved by way of bilateral, trilateral, multilateral, regional, global treaties. It can even be a cooperation agreement or memoranda of cooperation, MOUs that are signed by the countries. So it's a very loose arrangement between the countries. And uh, the facilities, the connectivity will require huge infrastructure investment. If you can see, the, the projected investment amounts to 1.7 trillion annually, okay, all the way to 2030. So there's a huge amount of money being poured into infrastructure. And what kind of projects are we looking at? Uh, as Jonathan has said, it refers to the Belt Road Initiatives refers to the Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st century Maritime Silk Road. And the belt, which is the land route, uh, link China to Europe generally by way of, of uh, rails and sometimes uh, just regular roads. And there is a sea route in the 21st century uh, Maritime Silk Road as well. And if you look at the map, that's, that's what is, that is the visual representation of it. Although I'm sure William there will disagree with me because there's a missing part of it, <laughs> crossing the Pacific all the way to South America. And that is actually a, grow, a growing part of the, of the Belt Road initiatives as well. But I'm sure William will tell you more about that. Uh, contracts of VRI, types of projects. What kind of projects are we looking at? Look at that, for example, you can see that overland transportation uh, from China to Europe now has been shortened to 12 to 14 days. That means you can actually send your goods over from Beijing to London you know, or to Germany in 14 days by rail. And that is one of the Belt Road initiatives that we are talking about. And I have set out here a table of all the projects that are actually undercurrent, uh, undergoing um, in ASEAN, Southeast Asia, okay? with all the countries that are involved, basically involving rails, involving ports, involving uh, road, power plants. Those are the kind of projects that will take place in the BRI. This gives you a breakdown of the kind of uh, projects that we are involved in. 44% of it is in trans transportation, 23% in power and water, and real estate is 18%. And manufacturing in nine percent. And here is a list of all the projects 
that have been uh, commenced under Belt Road initiatives. As you can see, it's a huge undertaking. And what kind of contracts can we expect? Well, this is a very simplified, in fact, oversimplified uh, hypothetical BRI contractual framework. You can have a joint venture between the Chinese investor and the local uh, investor, <coughs> and you have a shareholders agreement. And then you have a project company, and with a project company will enter into an EPC contract with an EPC contractor to construct whatever that needs to be constructed, whether it's a bridge, whether it's a power plant, and then there is the host government guarantee that we can talk about. There's a concession agreement. The local government will give you a concession to run the plant or the road for 20 years, 30 years. O&M contractor to manage the, the, the facilities. And then there is the financing from the commercial bank and the political risk insurers. And most of it are done through joint ventures or done under concessions. And these are some of the common financing methods of BRI projects. You have the World Banks who are involved, the ADB, and the AIB, which is the newest of the pack in terms of multi multilateral financiers. Uh, there are also funds. You can, there are uh, multilateral and bi bilateral funds that have been set up to finance these kind of projects. There's a silk road, silk road funds as well. And finally, there is the commercial banks that are involved. Uh, who will provide the, the missing piece, the last piece of the financing. So, you can see there that there is all this. This is a hypothetical case that we have, I've set up in, involving Indonesia, where the high-speed rail, the first high-speed rail that has been set up in Indonesia. It's, sorry, it's not hypothetical. It's a real case of, of a high-speed rail that is being uh, uh, constructed in Indonesia. And frequently, you also have the roles of the EPC contractor being expanded. They are not just coming in as EPC contractor. They are also coming in as investors. They are also taking a stake in the concession. Uh, most of the time, for example, in Malaysia, which is north of where I'm from, there is a huge railway uh, construction called the ECRL. And the EPC contractor originally was just a pure EPC contractor. But there was a change of government and the new government came in and they took a look at the project and thought that it was too expensive for them. And then the EPC contractor, the Chinese contractor, rose, evolved and they started to take stakes in the, in the project just to give confidence to the Malaysian government that it is viable. The total contract value that had been concluded by Chinese contractor in BRI countries in 2017 amounts to 144.32 billion. And uh, most of the contractors are Chinese, as you would expect, 27% locals, and there are the foreign international contractors who are involved as well. As you can see there, names like General Electric, uh, Caterpillar, Honeywell, ABB, they are all involved in the BRI contracts. So, you have seen that's a very quick background of what BRI is about, and you can imagine the amount of dispute that will come out of all these projects. That's why when when Johnny said that there's going to be thousands of disputes, I think there's going to be more than thousands of disputes. <laughs> the question is how are we going to resolve it? How are we going to take care of it? Right? This dispute has been described as inevitable, particularly for those of us who are involved in infrastructural development. When you're building complex structures, there are bound to be disputes. And um, there, were, there are all these multitudes of contracts that we have seen. And basically, there are three types of disputes that would generally arise out of a BRI project. There is the pure commercial disputes, the contracts that party enters into, the shareholders' disagreement, there is the EPC contractors' disagreement, the financing problems, and there is an investment dispute between investors and, and, and state. When you make an investment or when a Chinese investor or foreign investor make an investment, certain government policies have caused the investment to fail. There's always the possibility of suing the government under a bilateral treaty, multilateral treaty, exit. And there is also the, sorry, the last one is a state-to-state -state trade and commercial dispute. That is G to G, government to government. One of the biggest problems I think everybody is familiar with is the Sri Lankan Hambadota port, where the Chinese have invested a huge amount into the port, but the 
Because again, because there's a change of government, the new government took a different view of the viability of the port, and then they felt that they couldn't repay, and then there was a dispute between the Chinese government and the Sri Lankan government, and that was finally resolved by the Sri Lankan government giving a 99-year concession to the Chinese party for the port. So these are some of the case studies that I have listed. I won't go through them uh, in detail because we don't have the time, but there are, some of them has already arisen, and these are some of the reported ones that we know of. Okay, I will skip through them very quickly. This is the Hambadota one that I've mentioned about. Okay, so what is the mechanism that we can use to resolve the disputes? The first among equals, of course, will be arbitration. Arbitration is one that has been established. Everybody knows about it. Everybody uh, knows how it works. And it is the first type that we parties will resort, will resort to when they have a dispute. Uh, the other one is litigation. Uh, when we talk about litigation, we are not talking about going to the domestic court for resolve, resolution of the dispute. But there is a new, uh, a new type of courts called the international courts that have been set up basically just to deal with international disputes such as this. Um, I think among the, the list that I have put out there, the first one is actually the Dubai International Financial Center Court that have been set up. And then Singapore followed that up in 2015 with the Singapore International Commercial Courts. And in the last few years, there are three other international courts that have been set up in China as well to deal with these kind of international disputes. Uh, this is just a comparative table of the dispute resolution mechanisms that is available. And if we talk about international arbitration, what is the advantages? I'm sure all of us are very familiar with this neutrality and possibility of arbitral awards. Uh, mediation, again, is also uh, uh, something that's become very popular. Uh, Singapore Convention was signed three months ago in Singapore, which is the New York Convention equivalent for mediation, which allows mediated settlement to be enforced globally. Obviously, it's just started. Uh, it's not enforced yet, but hopefully that will help mediation to be a viable alternative for dispute resolution. And of course, as I mentioned, international courts as well. Uh, arbitration institutes and courts available uh, in... in Asia, of course, the most popular two institutes are SIAC and HKIAC, Singapore International Arbitration Centre and Hong Kong International Arbitration Centre, in addition to ICC. And uh, both of them have uh, a lot of features that are very popular <coughs> among the users. These are some of the statistics. And of course, in China itself, there's CTEC that's also very, uh, very established. It is, in fact, the institute that have got the largest amount of cases in the world, and, and, but most of it are domestic cases. International mediation, I've mentioned that just now, and the international courts. Being from Singapore, I'm, I'm obliged to do a little selling for SICC. <laughs> it is, uh, it's been set up five, uh, five years ago, four years ago, and uh, it's meant as a complement to arbitration, and we can talk about that <coughs> uh, further down. These are some of the features of SICC. And this is the jurisdiction of SICC. It's a branch of the Singapore High Court. And enforcement issues. Um, I think Singapore is a, is a signatory to the Hague Convention. But uh, I don't think it's as popular as New York Convention yet. Uh, there are countries like EU, the US, China are all signatories, although US and China, I don't think, have ratified it. I don't think it's come into force yet. And these are some of the benefits of SICC. And that's it. I will now pass on to my colleagues to talk more about the specific of what I presented. Thanks. Mm -hmm.